the the independent that went out there um, wasn't very friendly and he didn't tell the policyholder when he left and the gate was open in the backyard mm, yeah so the policyholder has two dogs one dog was really the husband's best friend well her husband died like six months ago and she looks around for the independent adjuster and says well i guess he left so she opens the back door lets the dogs out well the gates open so the dog that was her husband's favorite runs out in the street and gets run over in this video, me and veteran staff adjuster Andy Patterson talk about all of the dumb things that rookie adjusters do, starting now. You're watching Adjuster TV, adjusters first. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Kaplik. Learn all about E&O and other insurance for adjusters at cplic.net slash adjuster TV. And by the National Association of Catastrophe Adjusters. Joining NACA will provide you with the resources you need to build a lasting career as a claims professional at adjustertv.com slash NACA. And by Adjuster TV Plus. Get unlimited access to a growing library of the best adjuster training videos created by the most trusted name in claims, Adjuster TV at adjustertvplus.com. Hey, what's up, everybody? Matt here with Adjuster TV. And for the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, subscribe now. So very, very special uh, episode today. We have uh, in studio a guest. And he is uh, Mr. Andy Patterson, who has 25 years of carrier, like big carrier uh, experience, um, including seven years doing CAT, plus quite a bit of, I mean, what would you call it? Like, as far as like the, you were telling me about this and I can't remember what you called it, but basically, you know, you're sort of the person that has to help out in the, the agent's office. Yeah, so the last two years of CAT, or catastrophe, I was an agency liaison and doing service recovery work. And so me and you have talked about this before, so I got a firsthand view of what the first person didn't do correctly. Right. I'll say that nice. So, but yeah, <laughs> I was doing a lot of uh, cleanup. Gotcha, gotcha. So basically the, the customer's not happy, it, you know, and they go to the agents and then the agents are like, what's going on here? And then you gotta like kind of jump in and- Yeah, you're putting out a lot of fires basically. Yeah. Um, and most storms, what happens is they, they send everybody to the storm, like for a hurricane, for example. And then as the storm starts slowing down, they start pulling the IAs out. And then they, what's typically left is just staffers or super experienced independent adjusters. Right. And I was doing cleanup from that standpoint of just being there, taking new claims coming in. But I was doing cleanup in the sense that I was picking up after other people's messes too. Yeah, yeah. Which is instructive, right? It's, you're yeah. gonna be able to like, you can speak to a lot of the things that adjusters that they do that maybe they don't know are like the wrong things. Um, and just a quick note uh, before we kind of go any farther, um, you guys may recognize Andy from the Xactimate X1, um, the Field Ready Xactimate X1 training that we have inside of Adjuster TV Plus. Uh, and or the field ready stability training. Both of those are kind of foundational, you know, you ha you've never even seen it before, have it on your computer to get it downloaded and installed all the way to completing your file. I mean, that's something that we have in Adjuster TV Plus, which I'm super stoked about and I appreciate you helping hey, me out welcome. with that. Um, but let's talk about this a little bit. Let's talk about the the do's and don'ts. Um, maybe start with like the the very first biggest like thing that you that happens the most um, with independent adjusters that you're like, oh, we got another one of these. I got to clean up on on a, like hurricane, whatever kind of catastrophe stuff. Yeah. So <clears throat> one of the things that new adjusters do that immediately sends a signal to the policyholder that uh oh, this guy don't know what he's doing or this gal don't know what they're doing is you have let's say a one story house and you have several rooms that are involved. And on the floor plan, in reality, they're all connected. But since the new adjuster doesn't know how to connect the rooms and Xactimate, they sketch one and put it over here, and they put one over here, and they put one over here. And then the dimensions are wrong. So the insureds call 
or I get sent out there and I'm looking at this sketch and they said, this doesn't even look like my house. And so then I have to go in there, spend quite a bit of time to resketch everything. Right. And then another thing that is super simple to fix is read, read your estimate, review your estimate before you send it up. There's lots of zero line items. Yeah. That yeah. no quantity, no square footage, and, and they can immediately know, I don't know if this person knows what they're doing. Yeah. And so then they start questioning everything. Yeah. It's the little thing. And then that's basically if they put, they got a macro from one of their buddies at the orientation or in their hotel and drop that in and then just didn't delete the things that they didn't need. Speaking of macros, I've got a pro tip for you. <laughs> yeah. Something I started doing. So on my macros, you know how you can pull them in there and it's zero quantity? Yeah. I started putting uh, 999 in my quantity. And that way, when I look at my estimate, it's like $135,000. <laughs> then I go in there, oh, I left that in there so I can delete that All line right. item. It's just a tip that that's I, a, that's that I a did. That's a cool trick. But if you review your estimate. You got to review your estimate. Yeah, either way, you're going to. Those can still slide through, though. Yeah, and I guess on one hand, if you let those slide through and somebody doesn't catch it and they're writing a check for 125000 that would be bad. So Yeah, and then you're committed to it because right. the carrier is probably not going to be like, hey, can we have that check back? Right. It's going to be coming out of your, you know, so rear end. You, so if you're new, you <laughs> may way. just want to do the zero quantity. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so having an accurate estimate... Um, you know, having the, having the time in your schedule to, to be able to like truly focus on writing one estimate at a time, right? And then making a part of your workflow is to re, just do your own little baby file review of that file. Like, how's this gonna look? All right, I'm gonna do a print preview and go through this whole thing. I'm gonna look at the photos. I'm gonna look at the line items. Make sure that, you know, if I have like a uh, an estimate note that has, you know, maybe like in your macro, like in my macros, I put like, you know, the following line items are to replace the siding on the blank side of the house. Right. And I'll put a, like a whole bunch of X's there so that I can, when I'm scanning through it, I can see it. If I see those, you know, or that I have a depreciation line item or a depreciation note with no depreciation in there, it's X's or zero or whatever. And then I don't have the depreciation in my line items, that kind of thing. Those are the kinds of things that the file's going to get kicked back for that afternoon or the next morning that you're gonna have to deal with. And strictly from, I mean, not even talking about like, the homeowner sees that if it manages to get through an inattentive file reviewer, um, or if you printed it out on site, it's just gonna, you know, if you do, ha if it gets file reviewed, which it will, um, and kicked back to you, it's, it's, that's a lot of time, right? Because you could reopen the file, you have to change those things. It might change the total of the claim, and then you gotta call the homeowner and be like, hey, listen, you know, I, I told you yesterday or, you know, three days ago or whatever it was that the grand total was $7,514 and whatever. And now it's $6,000. Uh, it was my mistake. I'm sorry about that. Uh, you know, and they might, may or may not care. They probably will care. You know, obviously if it goes the other way, you know, if it's $12,000 instead of 7,500 bucks, they, they probably will be, oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but yeah, that's the thing is you bring up time management. Um, and I, I, I think I've narrowed this down to two issues that new adjusters uh, mess up on, or dumb things rookies do is what I call it. They left the house, and when a customer uh, wants a second inspection or complains to their agent, it's because the first adjuster didn't make them feel important, and they, the customer didn't feel like they mattered. Yeah. Let me give you an example. So if the customer mattered, then you would get them an estimate in a reasonable amount of time. And you would, if you said, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i go back to the office or go back to the hotel and I'll have the estimate to you in three days. Well, if it's three weeks, then the customer doesn't feel very important because yeah. you didn't do what you said. Um, and then just blowing through the, uh, blowing through the inspection, uh, the customer, I hear this all the time, they acted like they were in a hurry, they acted like they didn't wanna an answer any questions, um, and they just mailed me the estimate. Well, how important would you feel if they just sent you the estimate and a check with no explanation? Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember in Louisiana, um, working Hurricane Ida, I had to go out, and it was an older couple, and I resketched their house, and 
uh, I had an eagle view on the roof, so I don't have to mess with that. But it's mainly an interior thing, and they want to show me their vegetable garden in the back. And so I went back there and looked at their vegetable garden. I asked questions like, wow, what is that? What is that? <laughs> and they were just super thrilled. That's corn, Andy. Yeah, broccoli. <laughs> and they were just thrilled that I took the time to go back there. They, one of the remarks they said is like, the first person acted like they didn't want to come back here. Yeah. I don't know if they said that that person did go back there, but I took the time to go back there and look. To me, that's part of the claims process. Claims is all about relationships. And I was embedded in an agent's office, and that same couple came in there probably three or four times before I got released. And every time they'd say, where's that Andy? He's so nice. He went and looked at our vegetable garden. Yeah. If you're nice to customers and you treat them right, they're going to overlook a lot of inexperience. Yeah. So I actually found some, some, um, some research that was done on uh, medical malpractice. This is very interesting. I think it's very mm. interesting. Um, where they, they, they looked at um, the rate of medical like accidents or like incidents that could go to a malpractice suit stayed the same across all doctors, right? Or all medical, it was for doctors. Um, but they discovered that there was, um, there was a distinguishing factor um, that kind of separated doctors that were always getting sued or more often were getting sued for malpractice mm -hmm. versus ones who never got sued uh, or very rarely got sued for malpractice, but both had the same rate of like, act, like you know, sewing up the forceps inside the guy's belly kind of thing. Um, and the difference was that the guys that uh, didn't get sued very often or the doctors that didn't get sued very often or not at all, even though there was, an, there was some kind of a malpractice accident, they, the, the customer or the patient felt like the, the doctor was listening to them and was friendly. And the, the number one reason that the patients gave for not suing, well, we liked him. We liked our doctor. Really? And so they gave him, there was some grace there, right? And the other ones were, you know, it's the nurse comes in, they sit there and wait for an hour and a half and they may do the same thing in the, you know, at any doctor's office. The nurse comes in and does a bunch of stuff and then the doctor comes in for two and a half minutes, doesn't make eye contact, doesn't ask him any personal questions, doesn't smile, right? Doesn't like make the person feel like they're, they're being heard um, and then leaves the room and then, you know, basically the same thing as what adjusters do. And I think that that translates directly. You, if, if as an adjuster, you're gonna make mistakes, certainly. Um, Nobody's perfect. Um, but if you take, and it doesn't take hardly any time at all. It's not like no. you have to stay in there in the front yard for half an hour. Right. It could take two minutes. Exactly. Um, take a couple of minutes and, you know, you already tried to develop rapport on your, your first phone call with them by, by being cheerful and friendly, you know, circumstances, you know, appropriate, of course, if, if their house is gone, you're going right. to be a little bit more like, you know, what can I do right now to help you? Um, but if it's a hail claim, right, you know, how about this weather? You know, da, 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 brief piece of report to kind of demonstrate that you're a human being and you're not just another call center person, you know, whatever. I'm going to be out there tomorrow at nine o'clock. Looking forward to meeting you guys. We'll see you then. Any questions, you know, give me a call between now and then, blah, 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 blah. Right. And then the next day when you go out there, um, you take a couple of moments to sort of reestablish that, that rapport and to build on it. And you told me something that was really, really, I thought was really a really cool thing that I kind of was doing, but I didn't like, I didn't say, all right, now I'm going to do this. It was just something I kind of did. Um, and that was, you were saying that when you get to the house, one of the first things that you do is you kind of look around the yard and see if there's yeah. something that you can like pick out. So maybe talk a little bit about that and kind of, you know, explain how that's, that's helped you, you know, develop rapport and sort of build that grace. And if, even if you mess up the claim, you know, the homeowner still is like, well, we liked Andy a lot and, you know, we'll forgive him basically. Yeah. So that's a good question. <clears throat> um, and yeah, so I worked uh, auto catastrophe and I also worked property catastrophe last seven years of my career, but I'll give you some examples. So whenever you uh, work a catastrophe auto, normally they carry or sets up these big white tents and they have people drive through you stand out there in the tent and write estimates on cars all day. Well, it's a little bit intimidating 
whenever you see this big burly guy coming in with this big lifted truck and he's not smiling at all and he looks like he wants to rip your head off all the time i said man this is my kind of truck big and loud never failed they always crack a smile and i knew that we were gonna be fine because they have that connection and then uh, i remember looking at a house and i was I, when i pull in i always look for something that tells me this is important to the policyholder, like a vegetable garden um there was this wagon wheel in this house i was pulling up to and i get out go to the door and before i even start talking claims i just say hey my name's andy uh, i talked to you on the phone i'm gonna be doing the inspection on your house hey i love that wagon wheel out front and this lady got a huge smile on her face. She goes, oh my gosh, you noticed that? I said, yeah. She said, that, that was my grandpa's. He had it in his yard and he died several years ago and I put it in my yard. She was just so happy that I noticed yeah. that. It, boom, you immediately make a connection. Yeah. I've got a story that I think will drive this point home. So I was in Fort Worth a couple of years ago and my manager calls me and says, hey, you're gonna have to go out on the second inspection. The policy holder's upset and the contractor's upset. I said, all right. And he said, well, here's the issue, though. Um, the the independent that went out there um, wasn't very friendly, and there were some customer service issues, and he didn't tell the policyholder when he left, and the gate was open in the backyard. Mm, yeah. So the policyholder has two dogs. One dog was really the husband's best friend well her husband died like six months ago and so this lady was a widower so she had these two dogs and she looks around for the independent adjuster and says well i guess he left so she opens the back door lets dogs out well the gates open so the dog that was her husband's favorite runs out in the street and gets run over and so i'm walking into that and yeah. they didn't pay for the roof so I try to put claims aside when you're dealing with a personal issue. So sure. I go up to the door. I said, Mrs. Policyholder, I am so sorry that this happened to you. I hate that you're going through that. Um, I am sorry that we left the gate open. I'll make you a promise. I will leave the, I will, will shut the gate before I leave. Is there anything that I can do for you? And she's like, no, the first person, she goes on to tell me the first person was in a hurry, they didn't talk to her much, didn't answer any questions. And the contractor's like, yeah, dude, that guy was rude. I've never been around an adjuster that rude. Right. So I uh, went around the house, got on the roof, and I didn't find any damage. The first person didn't either. But before I left, they were shaking my hands and thanking me for coming out. My decision didn't change. Yeah. The only thing that changed was how I treated the customer. Yep. And that's key. Yeah. We'll call it bedside manner. Yeah, bedside manners. And so that that's kind of interesting that the doctors who had the better bedside manners were sued less. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Probably because they have a personal connection and, oh, I don't want to sue my friend. Exactly. That's exactly it. And again, I mean, I, all of these things... When adjusters get rushed, new, especially new adjusters that, that don't have a lot of experience in managing their time and managing all the things that come at them on catastrophe, especially their first or second or even third you know, catastrophe deployment, um, if they don't have space for all these things, you know, all the phone calls that are going to come in, they don't teach you about the phone calls, like the volume of that you're going to be on the phone with insurance, not like just making a contact call or making a settlement call, but all the other calls, right? S setting appointments, right. resetting appointments, reschedule questions. You know, you manage your calls, file reviewer calls. Got you know, hey, hey, you know, we're looking at your file, and you know, I don't see a picture of this in there. You know, just if you could run back out, you know, it's all the things that happen, like so many things, all stack up, and so adjusters get harried, and they get like they start to fall behind, and then they start, you know, they they're they're bedside manner is one of the first things to go and their their willingness to spend and it's literally i'm talking minutes not hours i i think that there's some there's some companies and i've heard people say this at firms you know we want you to spend you know at least at the minimum you know 20 minutes with the homeowner you don't have to i don't think you have to do that no. i think you just need to have super high quality over quantity standing there talking to the homeowner longer isn't going to do 
I mean, it might do something, but people still have other things to do besides stand there and talk to the adjuster for 20 minutes. If, you, if you're able to establish rapport right away, you know, when you walk up to the house, you're, you're actively looking at the, the front yard. Some people have like perfectly, like really well taken care of grass. Right. That's not easy to do, right? That nope. takes work. They may pay somebody a bunch of money to do it or they may be, do it themselves. You know, they open, garage doors open and you see in there, you see a bunch of like herbicide, like, you know, Roundup and all this stuff and a, and a nice zero turn lawnmower sitting there and, and the grass looks perfect. I'm gonna compliment that guy's yard, 100%. You walk into the front door, Maybe they have an interesting piece of artwork on the wall in the foyer, or you can see through and you're like, oh my gosh, did you guys remodel this place? It looks, you know, you can see quartz countertops and, you know, through the front door or whatever. I'm going to say something because people are proud of their homes, right? And if they're not proud of their homes, like some people aren't, you know, you walk, pull up to a house and you're like, there's nothing here that I can see. Maybe there's a Harley Davidson sitting in, under a tree, right? Nice, you know, nice bike. I've always wanted to, to get one or I have one, you know, or I've, I've only ridden Italian bikes. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, whatever, you know, you could, you could start a, a short conversation with the person and everybody, anybody will appreciate. It. I don't care if they're in a $10 million house or a $50,000 house. They will appreciate that you take a minute to notice something that they care about, right? Anything, pictures on the mantle. Right, they may have a bunch of baby pictures on the wall in the foyer, or when you walk in, or they've got a bunch of little dogs running around, you know, or cats. They may love all of their pets, you know, especially if they're yapping and yapping and yapping, and you're like trying to talk, and they're like, just this happens, and this is totally. This goes kind of the other way, I guess, but, <laughs> and I know you've had this happen. You, you finish your inspection, and the insured invites you in, and you sit down in the living room, and. and the news is on full blast yeah. or like the price is right or something like that. Or a dog is just sitting there like yap, 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 just nonstop, loud, piercing. And you're like, and the homeowner's just like, you know, okay, well, yeah, what do you got for us? And it's like TV's blaring. Um, you still have to be gentle and kind about that kind of thing. Um, the dog, I'm probably gonna try to ignore. The TV, I might be like, is there any way I can, can we mute this for just a second? You know, just nicely, right? Um, and then continue your conversation and maybe reach over and hit the mute button again to start it up and say, all right, I'll see you guys later. Um, but it doesn't take a lot of work. It doesn't take a lot of work. It just takes slightly more like active participation in the moment. You know, I guess we could put it that way. Um, because you, you don't have a whole lot of chances to, to, to build that grace to, you know, to, to kind of build that little buffer. You know, if, if you missed all the awnings on the back side of the house, but you took the time to four minutes to compliment the homeowners, you know, th they've got their 67, you know, Impala sitting out in the driveway. Looks, it's got, it looks like it was restored and you, oh my gosh, that is absolutely a beautiful car. Oh yeah, let me tell you about that real quick. Blah, blah, blah. Five minutes. Right. And then you miss a bunch of damage or whatever, right? You're going to have a little bit of grace because the guy's going to be like, well, you know, I, I feel like that, that person was trying to help me, right? And I have a little bit of affinity to them, towards them, like you said, because they, they noticed something that was important to me as, as the homeowner, as the customer. And that's all people really want, right? Yeah, because um, you build a connection. And one of the things that kind of irritates me when I'm doing a second inspection, policy holder says, hey, I pointed this out to the first person. They just said, um, just have the contractor send in a supplement. Well, for one, that's unethical. I mean, if you know that there's yeah. damage and you walk away and you don't address it, that's not right. You know, yeah. Don't treat people like that. And I know what happens is they're, they're way behind, they're stressed out, and the last thing they want to do is go back in to the customer's house, look at something else, and add to the rest of it because you're adding 20 to 30 minutes onto your day, and they don't have that time to spare. And I'm yeah. not talking about IAs necessarily. I'm talking about staff and IAs. They fall into this trap. But if you can build a, a rapport with a the customer, then it just disarms this it just disarms them for your meeting with them because what are they thinking? Okay, here comes the adjuster. He's going to rip me off. He's not going to pay for everything. Right. He's gonna find ways to save the insurance company money. I don't know. I can't speak for every adjuster. I never thought of it that way. I thought of it as I'm supposed to be a good steward with policyholder dollars because they have a policy contract 
let me look at the loss, apply the policy, and give them every benefit I can based on their policy. Yeah. Now, there's some things the policy doesn't pay for, but if you go in there with that mindset, thinking, where, where can I find coverage? And you build a rapport with the customer, they're going to love you, and they're going to overlook some mistakes. Um, this sounds cheesy, and you kind of uh, sound like this type of person too, but on my first few deployments, I did, I did a debriefing with myself. I went back when I got released and I wrote down the things that I didn't think I did very good and I worked on them the next deployment. And I know people are thinking, dude, you need to dial it back. <laughs> but if you don't practice in your downtime, and people talk about write, pra writing practice estimates, well, yeah, you need to practice that, but you also need to look and see what you can improve upon in your customer service, in your scoping, yeah. um, in your time management. That's what's really needed. Yep, yep. And, that, and I think for an independent adjuster, I think that's that's key, really, because you know we're gonna we're not gonna make the big bucks that everybody always talks about unless we're closing a lot of claims. But we're not gonna be able to close a lot of claims if they don't give us a lot of claims, right. and they're not gonna give us a lot of claims if our accuracy, our technical accuracy on our on our estimates and our scopes is poor, and or we're not taking care of the homeowner. And by taking care of the homeowner, I mean just exactly what we're talking about. Having a, a, a you know, a, a, it's easy to beat the minimum customer service rating. I mean, it's like what, 70%, you know, kind of a deal, 75%. Um, it's, I don't think it's, it's hard at all taking a couple extra minutes to be intentional, to be present in that moment with that, with that person, to make a, connect, a brief connection. It doesn't have to, again, we're not talking a half an hour here, to get you out of the upper 70s and low 80s into the, to the low to mid 90s or plus, right, to, up to 100. Um, it's not hard to do. It really isn't. And this is one of those things in, in the downtime or even while you're working, you know, you're like, all right, well, I, I can't seem to close more than four claims a day. What is the thing that's slowing me down the most? Start working on that. And then, you know, maybe you get up to, to you're able to close five claims a day. What's the next thing that's going to get me to six? And, um, I, I would write down the time. Like I arrived at the house at 9.58 and I'd write that time down. And then I finished my exterior scope and I would write that time down. And then I finished my you know interior scope or, or finished writing the estimate and putting the file together, write that time down. And then how long I, how long I, t I spent with the homeowner, right? Doing the settlement conversation. Cause I wrote them up on site. I was taught by State Farm to do that. And that's what I did my whole career. Cause I thought that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Actually the truth is, is I know every, nobody else does that hardly, but the carriers love it. Every carrier, even not even State Farm, like Liberty Mutual loved it. American Family absolutely loved it. Um, AAA loved it. Everybody that I've ever worked for, even though they don't say, like Allstate loved it. Some companies try to provide incentives to close on site. Um, other ones don't mention it because they know that the IA is just going to, they're going to scope and then they're going to stay up till midnight writing and they're going right. to scope. And then th and it's going to be like a long drawn out process. Whereas... I just figure out what they need me to do on the claim, sit in my truck, do it, settle up with the homeowner and go on to the next one. And the only thing I have to do at the end of the day is uh, hit the upload button, right? Maybe do a correction or two here and there, maybe make a couple phone calls, that's it. So figuring out that workflow helps me to get more claims done during the day, which means that it's with good quality, right? And good right. customer service. And then, which gets me noticed by my manager. And after you get noticed the first time doing that and you start showing up on subsequent events and you keep doing that, they, they really lean on you and they will pile claims on you. So you get more claims per storm and then you get more deployments per year and then you get, which adds up to more claims closed per year. And every claim, that's where the $100,000, the 120, the 95, the, the 160, that those incomes start to come into play because you recognize that that claims is a volume play, but there are certain key things that you absolutely have to maintain. You got to maintain that file quality and that customer service, and make sure that you know with the time management piece that you've got enough time to to write to to do the scope, and you're not getting backed up, and and you're you're handling all the phones that all the phone call volume that comes in, and all the other things that you have to do, the meetings and whatever, 
And, you know, if, if there happens to be construction or a car accident that causes backup and traffic for 45 minutes, it's not going to completely wreck your week, which right. is what happens to a lot of people. And I think that's a lot of the problems that you saw doing your, you know, uh, agency the assist or whatever. Agency liaison. The liaison, Service yeah. recovery. Um, that's big. It's the, the people may write great estimates or have the, the capability to do that. And under, under normal, no pressure situations, they're as friendly as can be, but pile all that pressure on and they start to fall behind and everything else just goes straight into the, the ditch. A couple of things I meant, there's a lot of people out there that you mentioned that could be super fast and they're like, I'm going to run and gun. I ain't got time for anything else. Yeah. Well, if you do that, you're probably going to get low customer service scores. And the other thing is, is I know people are hearing this, and, and you've talked about it, I've talked about it. Uh, you can be four weeks into a, a large storm and there's adjusters that don't have a closed file. And yeah. I know that that's hard for people to believe. They're thinking, that never happens. It does happen. Yeah. There's weeks go by and this person, maybe they scoped a bunch, but they don't have any closed files and probably half of their files don't have the estimate uploaded. That's not good when that happens. Um, when you talk about being efficient, there's so many things like you got to be good at scoping, good at exactimate writing the estimate, but you also got to be good at time management. Yeah, that's a key thing. Um, and then we were kind of talking about dumb things rookies do, um, like don't show up in an Uber. <laughs> yeah, tell us this story. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm kind of conflicted though because on one hand I think well he tried tried yeah. to get out there, but anyway this. I was working at this agent's office and this lady comes in and she goes, I'm not very happy with, and then says the carrier's name. And I said, well, why is that? Sit down and tell me about it. And so she goes, well, I had a guy come out to my house. He didn't get on my roof and he didn't look at my interior damage. And I told him about it. And I said, well, um, okay, what did he look at? He said, he walked around the house and then he left and he showed up at an Uber he said he didn't have a ladder and he didn't go inside. And I asked him why he didn't bring a ladder. And he said, well, that's the Uber. I had to do an Uber because my truck broke down on the way over here. But he could at least went inside and looked yeah. at the damage. And she goes, he was in and out in 10 minutes. I said, why did he only stay 10 minutes? He said he had to go because the Uber driver had to leave. <laughs> so on one hand... I give the guy credit because he did actually show up. But on the other hand, he probably should have just called her and says, hey, this is what happened. And I'm honest with the policyholders. I've been, I'm honest with everybody. I've told I've been, I'm too honest sometimes, but um, that's, that's how I operate. I mean, they deserve the truth. I'm not going to lie to them and say, sure. uh, this is my friend. He brought me. Uh, I just forgot my ladder. Just say, ma'am, I'm sorry. My truck broke down. I can do this inspection any other time, but uh, I've got to deal with this right now. I promise I'll go over there and do a good, good inspection for you. Just give them assurances you're going to take care of them. Yeah. Um, the other thing is get your estimates done when you say you're going to get them done, or a policy may see you in Target doing some shopping for food and cause a scene. Right, True story. right. So, um, and that's a, that's a reason there's just this little sidebar on that. It's the reason why you don't wear your storm shirts out to dinner, to the happy hour, to the grocery store. You're anonymous because people you're in it, especially in a smaller town, people will see you and they may, they may, you may, they may like you and be like, Hey, what's up? Or they may be not happy with what you, what you did. And they may still recognize you anyway, but at least you're not wearing like a bright red shirt with, you know, company, company logos on it. One of the other things that I heard a lot is, especially working Hurricane Ida, was, yeah, the first person said this was their first storm, or they've never worked a storm before, or this is their first big event. Um, so don't tell a policyholder this is your first storm. Don't have the policyholder hold your ladder for you when you get on the roof. <laughs> don't take the wrapping off the ladder in the front yard. That's I've, not good, I've especially if you're at a home, at an agency, 
field executive's house. Don't do that. Oh yeah, that <laughs> <laughs> sounds like there is a real story there. Yeah, they're you're, they're on their phone. The policyholders on the phone with the agent requesting a second inspection before you leave. I guarantee you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to be ready. You got to be ready to do this work before you get it, and you got to know what to be ready for. Which right. is the cha- and which is this is why we do these videos. Truthfully. Is to, is to try to get help you guys out a little bit because it's gonna things are gonna happen. I, that's happened to me. I was experienced. I had like I was had been an adjuster for like ten years, and I was visiting family over here in this state, and I got a call to go to this state over here. But I lived over here, and I was like, well, I've got most of the stuff I need. I got my laptop and everything. Um, I'll just run over there and pick up a ladder on on the way and start handling claims in that area. So I picked up a ladder on the way to the, my first inspection. A extension ladder and it's it's not complicated right it's this extension ladder um had the wrapper on it. i just threw it on top, top of the truck and strapped it down and pulled up to the, the homeowner's house and was like hey yep, sorry i just i you know i left my other ladder at home i just picked this one up and uh pulled the wrapper off of it threw it in the back of the truck and then somehow and i don't know how i, I still don't understand why this happened but the two parts of the extension ladder mm-hmm. got wedged together, so it wouldn't move. And if I if I leaned it up against his house, I missed the gutter. It wasn't t- long enough. And so I'm out there like trying to force the thing, like you know, just smiling and like trying to. Try to <laughs> and you know, next thing that happens is he's like, "Well, let me get you a mallet." And so I'm out, out there banging <laughs> on this thing. It took me 15 minutes to get it unstuck before I could get on the guy's roof, and it was I was deeply embarrassed. The other thing that happened. And this was on my very first ever claim. And it was with the uh, State Farm through Pilot. Um, I had a re-inspector trainer with me from State Farm, which was awesome that they did that. And mm-hmm. I don't know if they still, do they still do that? No. No, okay. Not with independence. Yeah, I wish they would. Anyway, I learned a lot from them and I probably got the, the best training out of all the training that I had from them. Anyway, I had one of those old folding ladders with the lever on it that had like three sections, three or four sections, right? And you could, you pop it out and you hit the lever and you pop it out all the way. And I, I pulled it all out and the RT is standing there talking to the homeowner and I set the ladder up and I was like, all right, I'm ready to go, you know? And uh, <laughs> she walks over to, to climb up the ladder ahead of me and she puts her hand on it and it folds in half and falls over into the bushes. <laughs> And she looked at me like, are you trying to kill me on our very first inspection? And the homeowner was like, you know, aghast. And I was like, uh, my face was bright red. Got it, 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 you know, kind of the point of this whole thing is we get your gear out and mess around with it a little bit before you, you know, yeah. before you show up on a cat site. You know, I mean, it's going to happen where you may be rushed to go to a storm site and you got to pick up a printer and pick up stuff at, at Staples on the way, you know. You go to the grocery store, you know, you go to Staples and then you go to the grocery store and then you go to your hotel. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's these little simple things that we try to talk about and we try to get people to help them. Cause this, this is a good career, I think. I mean, it's been really good to me. And if you get a good start with it, if you have build a good foundation, you know, it will continue to be, it'll be a good career over the long term instead of just like, well, I went on one storm and I made $14,000. I'm never doing that again. Um, it's, you know, I went on one storm and then I got another storm and then I got another storm and then the next year I did six storms and then the next year I did, you know, I was out nine months and, you know, next thing you know, you're, you're making really good money. You, you've developed really good relationships with both I firms and carriers because the carriers are paying attention. They're the ones that they're doing, they're going to QA you. It's the carrier that does it, right? The State Farm QA, the American Family QA, the Liberty QA. They're going to go out and, and look at your files and interview the homeowners because basically what they're doing is they're QA, they're doing the quality assurance for their firm, the vendor that's providing the adjusters. Right. And you just happen to be one of the, you know, they're going to pull everybody's files and look at them and they're going to ask them questions like, did the adjuster ask to use your bathroom? You know, were they, did they have, were they, were they wear, wearing, you know, logo, company logo attire? Were they, did they, were, was it clean? You know, was their shirt tucked in? They, did they have a big, you know, salsa stain down the front of their shirt? Were they wearing dirty pants? Were they wearing white tennis shoes? I mean, they're going to ask what what their car look like. They're going to ask all these things because, and so you have to have that stuff dialed, you know, um, 
And they will go through like the questions that they want and the things that they want you to tell the homeowner as well, right? Did they give you next steps? They, did they explain depreciation? If, you know, if they didn't properly, I can explain it again. You know, the QA person's gonna do that because they're an adjuster and they're gonna redo the whole claim, right? They're gonna reinspect the whole thing. They're gonna write their own estimate and they're gonna hold up your estimate and their estimate and say, all right, well, here's where, this is how we, you know, the company wants it done. Here's what you did, right? So they have their estimating guidelines that, that adjusters have to follow. Never mind following the policy. Um, there's a lot to this work. Individual pieces of it, it's not rocket science, right? Um, but putting it all together into one cohesive, making you a kind of a complete package, um, is where the people who succeed at this work and who um, make a career out of this, you know, and have a paid off house and a paid off truck and kids college paid for, the retirement funded and all that stuff. Those are the people that put all these pieces together and and really recognize that it's it's not all about them, right? It's right. about it's about serving um, and being there to to say yes and to help and be cheerful when you do it, have that good bedside manner, put all these pieces together. And um, any other uh I'm sure you've got a bunch of them, the, you know, the dumb things rookies do. Yeah, I've got a, a bunch of them. I've got examples where um, I was showing you where I went out on a fourth inspection. There was three adjusters ahead of me. The floor plan, floor plan was sketched separate rooms. Yeah. And then I had to go out there and fix it and sketch it properly and get the right measurements. But the first person didn't do the sketch right. The second person should have corrected it, but they did not. And I know that they were in a hurry and they're like, I ain't doing that. Right. Third person, same thing. And then you get somebody who thinks, okay, this isn't right. I need to fix it. But if you're, if you're new out there and you're thinking, I don't know if I should take, I don't know if I should do this as a career. It sounds scary. You can do it for sure. Um, you just need to be prepared when you go out there because the worst thing you can do as a new person is say, I got my license and I'm going to get my big break on a hurricane or a large scale event. If you do that, you're probably not going to make this a career because you're going to get kicked off a storm and you're going to get NFA, which stands for no future assignments with that carrier. But don't let these stories scare you off I mean, you can do it. Yeah. Um, and that's why I left my job with the major carrier I was with is I just couldn't see another new adjuster fail. Even though I was making good money with the carrier, uh, 25 years into my career, I just thought there's something better out there that I could do with my time. And so I quit my job and I wanted to get into helping adjusters. And this sounds cheesy, but it's true. And I think it's a life lesson for everybody. So on my days off, because a staff adjuster, you get days off. Yeah. Uh, which is nice because I couldn't imagine working seven days a week for months on end without getting days off. But anyway, I like to go hiking wherever I, I'm at. And so uh, a couple of places I've noticed on the hiking trail, they have this bench that says in memory of, and it gives the person's name. Yeah. And this is what triggered me to go ahead and leave my job and go ahead and try to get into helping new adjusters. Because I thought, you know what, when I'm gone, I don't want to... I don't want somebody to have to put a bench out for people to remember me by. What they're going to remember is how well you treated them. Yeah. Man, that guy helped me out. He took his time to walk me through a claim, or he was nice to me. That guy stopped and fixed my flat tire. That, that's what they're going to remember. That's your memorial, is how you treat people. And so that's why I quit my job. Uh, I know that sounds cheesy, but that's just the way it is. I mean, I, that's why I quit. Sure. And I know you're you're all about helping people too. And I I've watched you I, even as a staff adjuster. I've been watching you and following you for uh, about a, about two years. And everything you do for new adjusters is is amazing. Well, thanks. I, and I, it's it does sound cheesy. I don't think it's cheesy because I kind of it's, it's similar for me. I mean, I was twenty years into a, a career as a claims professional, mm -hmm. um, and I, I, truthfully. And I still get offers every now and then. So <laughs> don't think that I'm, you know, I, I, I can kind of write my own ticket basically. Um, but I re kind of retired from doing claim stuff because I wanted to, 
And this is, and it started on her, like the hurricanes. Like when I first got started, I was running gun and, you know, I started to kind of figure the customer service thing out. I didn't have my first hurricane until about 2004 and I'd already been an adjuster for about five years. And I saw, it was shocking to me how many adjusters washed out yeah. on, on that hurricane and every, every single hurricane I've ever worked ever since people wash out. They wash, wash out on hailstorms. If there's a big enough hailstorm and they, they, they put a, a bunch of new people on it. And people that I know, I'm like, I'm not like a super genius. I'm not, I'm any harder of a worker than anybody else, I don't think. And I managed to figure this out, right? And it, it was touch and go at the very beginning, I, you know, could have gone either way, but I saw the potential for this, for this particular career to help me to do what I wanted to do. Um, and to kind of achieve the financial goals that I had. Um, so in the back of my mind, after those first hurricanes, I was always like, well, what can I do to help people? Right. So I wrote a little like book about it. You know, here's like the things you need to know to get started. And then I, I put together like a, a schedule, like b- based on how I know hurricanes go and, and what I think at, and a, a new brand new adjuster who's their first deployment's a hurricane, mm-hmm. which is it's going to be rough right. no matter what. Um, and you and I, we talked about this. We don't like to work hurricanes because they're, yeah, they're, they're no fun. They're not any fun. Um, but uh, it's true. A lot of times they are the, a new adjuster's first opportunity. So I put together a little schedule, you know, you do these, this many claims a day for this many days, you know, and you take it and then you take an office day and then you do, you know, and you ramp up, right. And then here's how, how you make your phone calls here, how, how you do all this stuff. Um, I tried to get some firms to, um, help, let me help them develop, uh, a small training around that and didn't really receive a whole lot of, of positive response about it because, because I think it was, and you're putting myself in the shoes of the firms. It was one more thing, not proven, not tested. Um, not, it's it, not totally clear how that could really d- benefit anybody or benefit them and this, the model that they have works and it's everything is built around that model. So they were like, well, you know, we're not, we think it's, you know, if you're onto something mad and we appreciate you wanting to help people out, but we're, you know, we're going to pass on that. Totally fine. You know, no hard feelings mm-hmm. or anything. Um, so in the back of my mind, it was like, well, what, what else can I do? Right. And, you know, I did the same thing. I quit doing claims at the, I think at the end of 2018, I'd had adjuster TV for been running it for a year and was, was being, was seeing the potential of it to, in, to help people and to, you know, I could still earn money with it. Um, and I, I kind of basically at the, I did my last claims. They were daily claims in, uh, uh up in the Seattle area. Nice. And then when I did my last one, that was it. Um, kind of burned the boats in the Harbor, as they say, let my licenses lapse and no going back. And I think that, uh, I really enjoyed this. I applaud you for wanting to do it because I, I I understand why you're doing it. And it's not like, well, he's full of it because he's just saying that to try and sell something or whatever. I mean, you could say the same, people could watch this and say the same thing about either one of us, I guess. But the truth of the matter is, is it wasn't easy to, to get, especially Adjuster TV to this point um, and to build the relationships that we built. And, and you know, I, ha- I get emails all day long, every single day from people thanking me for helping them do X, Y, and Z, which is what this is all about. And it, and it helps me to figure out new ways or better ways to um, create, create resources that will really, really move the ball, really move the needle um, in helping people to you know, get past that first storm and launch into you know, having, find, getting the benefits and the rewards of this career. Um, so... Yeah, so I, I, I quit and uh, haven't looked back. And I think that, uh, you know, if, if anybody's been watching Adjuster stuff on YouTube for any length of like the last three or four or five years, you're going to see that a lot of people come and go. And it's not because um, they were good or bad necessarily, but mainly because the money as it, as it claims Adjuster is so good that when storm season rolls around and your phone starts to light up, um, they're going to stop doing videos basically hmm. and go run cat all summer. And then and if they get a hurricane, they're going to go do the hurricane. And then by the time they get back home and they, they spend some time with their family a week or two and kind of decompress from the whole thing, 
it's getting close to Christmas time. And like, all right, you know what? Maybe I'll start making some videos in January. And uh, then they kind of ramp it up again. And then March, April, then they do it again, right? So they're doing this and they're not de fully dedicating themselves to uh, doing the YouTube thing or, or, or doing some kind of training thing for adjusters. Um, because if you're making $130,000 a year and all you gotta do is run claims and you're good at it and you know you're gonna get that work, it's hard, there's no time to do the video stuff right. when you're on cat. There's zero time for it. Even with really good time management, if there's just not enough time. I wouldn't wanna try it. So I decided to say no when the calls started coming in in spring, storm season you know, blows up. And it's been the best thing I've ever done for myself. That said, I think if somebody is looking at this career as a claims adjuster, um, that they can do the same thing and they have the opportunity and it's a great job and you don't want to do YouTube videos and do all this kind of stuff and train people. You just want to have a great, great job where you can help people. I would do the same thing. Obviously there's a lot of steps in preparation for, um, you know, quitting your job when there's a good time to quit your job and a not good time to quit your job. Um, and we, I've got a, a whole full, just super quick, full training about that um, at adjustertv.com slash start. Um, I have, I think it's nine videos um, and a great big um, checklist and a guide that goes along with this totally free. Um, and it explains step by step, when do you quit your job? How much are you gonna make? What gear do you get? What training do you get? What licenses? Everything, step by step. Here's the very first thing you do. Here's how you get work right away. Um, step two, step three, step 14, you know, et cetera, or whatever. I can't remember how many steps are in there. There's a bunch, but there it's, you know, there's a roadmap. It's a roadmap, right? So this, these are the things that are going to get you ready to, to, to rock and roll. Um, check that out. Adjustertv.com slash start. If you got questions about it. Um, yeah. And that's what new people really need is, um, a coach or a mentor out in the field with them. And if, if you, if you surf Facebook or social media, you're always, saying, hey, I got my adjuster license, I need a mentor in Florida. And from what I understand, you're starting this fast track, uh, this master class, fast track to deployment. They're essentially getting a coach. Now you can't be everywhere at once, but you're building these courses specifically targeting new people and what they're going to typically see on their first storm. Right. Most new folks aren't going to get a deployment to work a wildfire because they would get washed. They would wash out. Yeah. A lot of experienced adjusters would wash out too. So they're typically going to get wind, hail, maybe a hurricane. And what I like about what you're doing is you're crafting or building these courses to help the new adjuster get past their first storm. Because once you get past your first storm, then everything else, it's like building blocks. You can build on that. Yeah. And when you're looking for a job, it's not always what you know, it's who you know. And the other component about your program is you're saying, hey, this person went through my program, they're ready to go, and you pass them off to the firm or at least give their name to the firm. And so you're kind of like giving them a job referral as well. I think that's great. Yeah. And I know that you could make so much more money as an independent adjuster right now, but just the fact that you are doing this for new people is, is just great. And I've enjoyed your content over the years as an, as an experienced adjusters. And I know new people out there um, enjoy your content as well. And I think this new thing is super exciting for anybody new wanting to get into the business. Sure, sure. And I, thanks for bringing that up. Um, so, and what, what Andy's talking about is a new program that we put together uh, that's, a, that's an actual certification. And you've probably seen some videos um, kind of pop up here and there on the internet, YouTube and stuff about it. Um, basically kind of the, the broad strokes of the whole thing was, is that I had, uh, several, um, IA firms, including a couple of the absolute biggest ones approach me, um, through the relationships that I developed with them, um, and ask if, you know, they, and they do it kind of often, um, you know, Hey Matt, do you have a list of adjusters that, you know, you, you think would be really good that would be able to hit the ground running right out of the gate. If you could, you know, if you have one, send it over to us. You know, if you got anybody, let's let us know, send it straight to me and then I'll, I'll fast track them or whatever. Or they, you know, recently a couple of firms asked, um, if I had a, if I had a pipeline or if I could develop a pipeline, um, of new adjusters that again had, um, had their minds right about this work, um, who had, 
um, you know, an understanding of the basics of, of what they needed to have to hit the ground running and had been tested, like I'd somehow vetted them. Um, so I thought about it a bunch and um, put together a certification plan, a, pro, a program really, where um, there's a series of live trainings um, coming up on starting the 8th of July. This is July 5th. And um, the first training, the first training session is on July eighth, and, and the the enrollment period ends on Thursday, so in a couple of days. But what we're, what we're going to do is um, sort of uh, give enrollees um, a framework for every like main piece of of work that they're going to have to do as. An, an independent adjuster on their first storm. So they're going to have basic an, an overarching time management framework, which helps them to know exactly what to do every hour of every day, every day of every week, every week, every week of every uh, the, the month, first month, or if they, you know, hang, hang in there first two months, maybe, um, what you're going to do on every single day, how to handle all those phone calls that are coming in that we, we talked about, how to, when to do inspections, when not to do inspections, when to, you know, when to write your estimates, what to, you know, how to handle all that stuff step-by-step step without any guesswork, right? No, there's no like vague, you know, anything. It's, this is a specific, you do this at this time, you do the, this, that at that time, it's so on and so forth. Um, as well as um, sort of uh, systematic, repeatable um, plans for efficiency, right? And efficiency in scoping, efficiency in moving through the software, um, and of course, moving through your day, which is that overarching time management piece. So we're going to go deep on scoping. We're going to go deep into, into software in the context of a claim, not necessarily like, hey, here's the on button for your computer kind of thing. It's going right. to be, all right, here's how we're going to use Xactimate. To, you know, here's, here's a shortcut in Xactimate to help you um, be, be faster and more efficient so that you can get this work done and handle all the other things that are going to come at you, especially as a new adjuster, trying to handle the, you know, maybe you've got to be two and a half hours away from your claims because there's no hotels, right? High fuel prices, all this stuff are going to help you to try to save money and save time so that you can get all this stuff done. All the phone calls and corrections and stuff that are going to come at you, which they're going to, they're going to, yeah. it's the fire hose. That's why they call it that. Um, so that's all put together into a, like a training, um, some live training sessions, um, started, like I said, starting the eighth. Um, and then at the end of that, you'll, be tested. We'll ha you'll have the opportunity to be tested. And then if you pass the test, the testing uh, part of this, then you'll be certified. And I will personally put my name on you and say, this person, you are ready. And I will give you to our partner firms. Um, and our partner firms are Pilot right now, as of this recording, Pilot, Alacrity, and Paysetter have all agreed to when they get your name from me, as a new adjuster, they're going to fast track you to the front of the line for the next available opportunities where they can deploy new people. It's not a guarantee of work. Even experienced adjusters who've been doing this forever still have to wait by the phone, right? But it's going to, it's going to fast track you and give you priority onboarding and on priority uh, deployment opportunities where they're able to, to field new adjusters. Um, so all that said, you know, you can find out more information about it by going to adjustertv.com slash certify. Um, you can certainly shoot me an email if you have questions about it. That um, If you go to adjustertv.com slash contact, that contact form goes straight to my email. Um, and then, um, but you've only got a couple of days to jump on it. So if you have questions, by all means, you know, uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out and ask me about it. Um, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, but again, I mean, I... I Really, the, the the bottom line of the whole thing is that everything we're talking about that um, is responsible for new adjusters washing out, getting kicked off storms, and that kind of thing. We we're ta we're tackling all that so that they don't get kicked off storms in that certification. And I'm certifying that that person is absolutely ready and knows everything that they need to know to survive, right? right? And 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 to ultimately to thrive to start getting new claims on that first deployment and then getting more deployments after that. So pretty excited about it. It's kind of the first time we're really doing something like this. So it's, you know, um, we're gonna continue to build on it. Um, there's ongoing um, support 
every week for it. If you're not ready to certify right right out of the gate after the end of the first live sessions, you, there's you know that the trainings will all have replays to them, and you can you know we want to make sure that you're ready to to, to pass before you take the certification exam. Um, so we ha will have resources and things like that to support you until when you're ready, and you'll have lifetime access to that. If you fail, you can retry, and we'll figure out wh why you failed, and we'll focus on working on those things for you. So it's just to help, this help help adjusters. It's not necessarily just to like say we got a certification and try to get you to buy it. It's so that you can you can survive, and you can do this. I mean, if I can do it, I can do it. <laughs> if you can do it, you know, we're you know put us together. I think we. It's a third of a brain. Yeah, I think we're, yeah, 66% of a normal brain. Yeah. If we can do it, you can do it. So, um, all right. Well, I think that'll wrap up this edition of uh, Adjuster TV and uh, in the studio conversation. Um, and we will catch up with you guys on the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great storm. Adjuster TV. You either love us or you're wrong.